This is Judith Simon Prager. I've developed Verbal First Aid, and you are watching Facets Television. I'm Tim Jamal, President of the Board of Trustees of the South Orange County Community College District, and you are watching Facets Television. <laughs> Welcome to Facets Television, and we have with us today Judith Simon Prager. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you have a very interesting field that you work in. Can you describe uh, both the title of it and then uh, what's involved in that? Thank you. We teach, I, with a partner named Judith Acosta, we teach something called verbal first aid. Verbal, 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 verbal first, first aid, aid <laughs> is how to speak in medical emergencies to change the outcome. When someone's in an emergency, they go into an altered state of consciousness. Yep. Okay. They are, their prefrontal cortex, which is their thinking brain, yep. gets hijacked by their primitive brain, and they forget how to think. And they're almost in a trance. So everything you say to them becomes a suggestion. I train firefighters, police officers, doctors mm -hmm. all across the world and across the nation in how to speak when somebody's in an emergency. But the really important thing about the Shan is that anybody can use it any time because it could be that a child is injured, the car in front of you goes out of control, grandpa walks across the floor and grabs his heart and falls down. What you say at that yep. moment this is the important part, changes not only the chemicals that go through his body and his ability to heal, but how he remembers the incident. Does he remember it as a trauma? Is it the worst thing that ever happened? Or does he remember it as a time of rescue? And maybe even a time when he exerted his own courage. And that makes a difference both in the present and in the body and in the future in terms of PTSD. So there's, yeah, it's so so there's simple. a big challenge with this that I see. In other words, you describe the state of mind of the of the victim, if you will. Mm -hmm. But the crisis worker it may be just as scared or just as, you know, uh, traumatized by the event as anybody else. So how do you work with them to get them to be able to follow your techniques? Well, you see, that's why we have a protocol. Okay. Because when you, it's not just knowing exactly what to say, but it's knowing how to approach someone, how to center yourself. Yeah. The first step is centering yourself and remembering yeah. you're there for a reason. You have everything you need right with you right at that moment because presence is the most important gift you can give anyone who's injured. Okay. When somebody's injured, they think to themselves, if they can think at all, if it's not yeah. brain damage, yeah. if they've been hurt, they think to themselves, what am I supposed to do? Oh, no, my life is ruined. Oh, no, my arm is broken. Oh, no, I fell off the roof. Whatever they're thinking. And they think there's something they're supposed to do. So they make adrenaline and cortisol, and they get all worked up, okay. and their heart palpitates, and they breathe heavily, and everything goes wrong. If somebody else is there, just even presence, okay. so takes presence. their hand yep. especially yep. and says, I'm right here. Oh, I'm relaxed now. You see, <laughs> they can give, turn it over to you. They don't have to feel bad. And you don't have to know but how, how to But how do you actually CPR. train the people to follow the techniques? Because you, you, you obviously know a lot about this, but how do you get that information across in a short period of time to the people who are going to be the crisis interveners? Well, first of all, are you helping me advertise my books? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have three books on the subject. We have The Worst is Over. Worst is Over. Verbal First Aid and... Howie Cadabras. Howie magic. Cadabras. Somewhat magic. Yes. Okay, great Somewhat title. magical way to heal yourself right, and your fantastic. friends. So the, the crisis intervener could read the books. But, but I also give lectures all okay. over the world. I've been in... In China, they had a an earthquake that killed 80,000 people. And they brought a crisis team first. Okay. And then after they left, they had me sit with them for a while. Okay. What was happening was parents, mothers especially, who had lost their child as the school collapsed, and they're only allowed to have one child and are 40 years old and don't know if they can have another, were committing suicide. Yeah. And they didn't know how to talk to those people. And it's not like you can solve it. It's not like you can yeah, say, oh, exactly. you know, adopt a child. You can't, there's nothing you can say. But as I stood there and tried to figure out, one woman came up and she turned her back on me because the crisis counselors in China do it on the phone. And she said, I can't see the person, so you can't see me. And I said to her, tell me about your daughter. And she pretended to be the person who had lost the daughter. And she said, she's four and she loves to dance. And I said to the 
the, the therapists in the audience People like to talk about someone they lost because it keeps them alive. And then I said to the woman, you know that she lives. She lives in your heart. And that, when I realized, I'm getting goosebumps saying it, when, when, I, when that came through in an, as an idea for me, what I realized was that's a reason for her to stay alive. Don't commit suicide. Keep the memory of your daughter alive. You're the one who's here to do that. So uh, that was, that's not really as so much verbal first aid as just figuring out what to just say in the moment. Basic empathy, right? Basic empathy yeah. and rapport are the building blocks yeah. of verbal first aid. And then there were words, the special words to say. I, I mentioned two of them. One is, I'm right here. Okay. When a child falls, as soon as a mother or an adult says, I'm right here, okay. the child just looks to see, should I cry? If they're upset, then I'll get upset. But if the parent <laughs> or someone says, we're right here, we can take care of this. So aren't you then the crisis worker applying first aid to the crisis intervener? I mean, you're, I mean they're scared too. Um, you know, they're potentially in a panic. They, make it, they could easily do the wrong thing. They may be suffering from some of the same things as the victims. Yes. And we learned this from 911, right? I mean, the, cri the crisis workers there, the interveners, were had as much trauma as anybody. Yeah. So they look at you as their crisis worker, right? It's really true, and I train a lot of 911 um, dispatchers. Okay. I was just in North Dakota for a nine hour training of 911 okay. dispatchers. I did it in Rochester, New York. Okay. So, yes, when you train them, because they have very little training, they yep. don't have, yep. they learn CPR. They're often volunteers. That's right. And so, Yes, you have to teach them how to take a breath, how to find yeah. out their center before they even approach someone. But what and I'm thinking is you say, I am here to them, right? I mean, you're their security <laughs> blanket. You're their first aid or band-aid or whatever. Right? I, thank you for saying that. Actually, the title of one of our books is The Worst is Over. And that's one of those things that's true and comforting. When somebody's injured, if you say the worst is over, what you're saying to them is, now we start to put you back together okay, again. Okay. Yeah, okay. you okay. fell, you hurt, yep. you're, but we're gonna, we're right here to help fix it. And so I, what you just said makes me think that probably that's what I'm saying to the crisis workers. Yep. I'm yep. saying to them, the worst is over because I can give you a protocol that will allow you to know what to say and to, to be a hero, to, yep. to help somebody else. And, and sometimes had, it's very simple. And you had the magic words, I'm here now. You know, that's, and that's one a, of them. I'm right a, here. I'm know? right here. And that's a change from when you weren't there, and it's a big change. You can right? turn over the fear and the concern to me because I know what's going on. Yep, yep. Do you, you I've know, done this before. Yeah. Do you know that, um, do you remember when Gabriel Gifford was shot in the head at, yep, a, at yep. a... um very much so. It was horrible. She was a congressperson and she yep. was shot. She had an assistant who had only been with her for a few weeks. He was not medical. Yep. He didn't know anything about medicine. She shot in the head and he sits down next to her. He takes her hand. And he sits with her and waits. I mean, he didn't even know anything what to say. And he sits with her and he waits for the EMTs and paramedics to come. And I have a picture that I use when I give my lectures. Okay. He's holding her hand as they're putting her, her on yep. the yep. stretcher to take her. He won't let go. Yep. And I really believe that she recovered from the most critical injury you can imagine because she was able to turn over her fear and her belief that somebody else, and there was somebody not even equipped, and that's most of us. I have never been, I have to admit, I've never been at the scene of an accident. But everyone I've trained, I get letters every day, people saying I did it and it worked, and I, one woman heard it on NPR. I bet one of you out there is gonna hear this and say, I'm gonna find this out and do it. <laughs> she heard on NPR what to say, she was in an accident within a week. She said the right thing, yep. took care of the mother, took care of the children, waited, she was the point person for the police, for everybody, used this, the woman's cell phone, she, did, she was calm, she did everything, and she wrote me, and she said, it resonated with me, I heard it. So let me ask you, a lot of this sounds like, when you talk about the untrained and people that have never been through an accident before, it sounds like helping people just get back to being basically human, the natural <laughs> instinct to help, or you know, be neighborly, or friendly, or caring. Well, there's, what, what is it beyond that? Yes, there's one really major rule, and that yeah. is, uh, I'll give you a quick uh, example. Close your eyes. You don't have to. We always say this, though, in hypnosis. Close your eyes and picture any animal in the kingdom of animals, any animal you like except elephants. Don't think about African elephants with the big ears, <laughs> and don't think about circus elephants. What are you thinking about? You're thinking about elephants Snakes because in the sentence... <laughs> 
You're thinking about in the sentence, don't think about elephants. You're thinking, there's nothing else. You, there's nothing else to think about. There's nothing else to picture. So there, a little kid comes to you and he's going, oh, my stomach hurts. If you say don't vomit, you might as well duck and cover. Maybe you never thought of vomit. Maybe you never, vomit, oh, there's a thought. Now there's a useful tip right there. That's yes, it's <laughs> very important. This is what we say. Say what you want to have happen and not what you don't. Ah, okay, that's Whenever a good one. Whenever grandpa like that, yeah. grabs his heart and falls down, and you say, don't die. And he thinks, die? Could I die? I thought this was just pain. Well, you think it's a loving thing to say, don't die, but you don't want that picture in his mind. And he is, because he's in an altered state, that's a suggestion. So okay, so let me ask you. So you've got books, you do lectures and so forth. Um, this is a lot of information for people to digest. If they want to learn more, what would you suggest they do first? Well, the books are the most accessible, and, and I'm okay. not pushing them. I'm just okay. saying they, they exist. I have some things on my website. It's just okay. judithprager.com, and there's some okay. interesting things. And um, there's even a verbal fa first aid for kids part of the okay. website. They, there's songs, and there's parts of this book shown. And so all the kinds book's of the website, and uh, they can contact you, I assume? And or? you know what else? I just was called to one of the schools five schools in Los Angeles to talk to teachers about how to talk to kids about lockdown. When you say to a kid somebody could come in this school with a gun and shoot you, that kid's going to have nightmares forever. How do you talk to them and let them know that this is more like a fire drill and more like helping you feel safe? So I teach teachers how to talk to kids okay. too. So you teach a lot so of people. So anyone how to can this. say to me, can you come to my group? Uh, yep. I I love communicating this Apparently, so yes, much. We, we, get, we get that. <laughs> so much that it's not even, you know, like a job and how much yep, money. Yep. And it's just, the thing that I love about it is that people go off and do it. Well, and I'm sure that's what they love about you. So thank you for entertaining our audience and giving them some leads into how they can follow up, whether it's through the books or your website. It's been a great pleasure having you on here. We could probably go on for a couple of hours, but... Uh, I know you have a history of this, too, yes, and I know you're... my wife and I met as volunteers at a crisis center, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're disciples already. So thank you very much for Such sharing your pleasure. knowledge with thank our public. Thank you. This is Shan Steinmark, and you've been watching Facets Television. <laughs>